believe it or not, this is part three of First John. <laughs> we have made it to chapter three. Um, these might go a little bit quicker, so this video may be a little bit shorter than the other two. They're just so meaty. So we are going to continue on. Welcome back to you guys. Hi to my new subscribers. This is um, part three. I didn't realize we were going to have a part three series. So anyway, you might want to catch number two and number one so that you kind of know where we are if you're just landing on this video. But anyway, my name is Rhonda and welcome back. So we're going to 1 John chapter 3. I'm just going to jump right in so that we can make this happen. See what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God. And so we are. The reason why the world does not know us in, is that it did not know him. He meaning Jesus, it meaning creation. Believe, beloved, we are God's children now. And what we will be has not yet appeared. But what we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is, and everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. Talking about when Jesus comes back, we're going to be, when he comes, we have no idea what we're going to be like at that time. We just know that we are trying to be and trying to walk like, like Jesus. And to make it make sense, <clears throat> It says, the thought of being born of God arrests John with wonder, and he calls on his readers to take a look at the wonderful love that brought us into the family of God. Love could have saved us without making us children of God, but the manner of God's love is shown in that he brought us into his family as children. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God. Now, as we walk from day to day, the world does not recognize us as children of God. The people of the world do not even understand us or how we behave. They don't get us. Indeed, the world did not understand Jesus when he was here on earth. He was in the world and the world was made through him and the world did not know him. He came to his own and his own did not receive him. He came to what he created and they did not recognize him. Since we have the same characteristics as the Lord Jesus, we cannot expect the world to understand us either. So true. <laughs> so true. However, understood or not, we are children of God, and this is the guarantee of future glory. It has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we do know that when Christ is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. This does not mean that we will be physically like Jesus in heaven. The Lord Jesus will have his own definite appearance and will bear the scars of Calvary throughout eternity. Each of us, we believe, will have his own distinct features and will be recognizable as such. The Bible does not not teach that everyone will look alike in heaven However, we will be morally like the Lord Christ Jesus, <clears throat> the Lord Jesus Christ. We will be free from the possibility of defilement, sin, sickness, sorrow, and death. So we will be glorified. We will have a glorified body. We don't know what it's going to look like. Is it going to be having skin? Is it not going to have skin? What is it going to be like? We don't know. We shall find out. <clears throat> Okay, so let me go down to the next one, which would be four. Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous, he as he is righteous. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. 
No one born of God makes a practice of sinning for God's seed abides in him and he cannot keep on sinning. Because he has been born of God, by this it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. So that was chapter three. Um, what I, I just made a little note in, over in the margin. It says, remember Jude, verse 11. Oh, that's, I'm sorry, that's coming from down below. We'll get to that one. <laughs> but I put love is God. That was my little bubble. And um, so we are now moving on. There's th this is one of the three key passages in the New Testament dealing with the sinless humanity. And this was back in chapter, um, I mean, verse five. It says, you know what, that he appeared in order to take away sins and in him there is no sin. It says, this is one of the three key passages in the New Testament dealing with sinless humanity of the Lord Jesus Christ. Peter tells us that he did no sin. Paul tells us he knew no sin. Now John the disciple who knew the Lord in an especially intimate way adds his testimony, in him is no sin. So whoever abides in him does not sin. Whoever sins has neither seen him nor known him. So this verse contrasts the true believer with one who has never been born again. And it can definitely be said of the true believer that he does not go on sinning. Rather, it says that when a person sins habitually, it is conclusive that he was never regenerated. And that just kind of was what I was, um, I don't even know if I said it out loud, but I was thinking it. <clears throat> when we when we are saved and the Holy Spirit starts changing us, there's things that we may have used to do that we didn't think twice about or cuss. cuss was, cussing was a big thing that I did. Um, I just had... I'm telling you, just I was had so much anger in me, and sometimes French fries just doesn't feel as good as the other word, you know. It just and I just had a, a a mouth on me, and when I completely surrendered, I can't that that just left, and French fries and fudge sickles and things like that. Those are like expressions now that I even giggle over because I don't even say those nearly enough. I don't get offended hardly anymore. I can't even explain it. I'm telling you. So the any habitual sin flees. It just does. You're, you are transformed and those things that you probably didn't really pay attention to or think about because they were so habitual, one day you just realize that you haven't used them you haven't done them you haven't said them you haven't gone there you haven't watched that kind of horror movie you haven't i mean just things they just kind of left they just left the desires were gone to do that and so the question naturally arises when does sin become habitual how often does a person have to commit it for it to become characteristic behavior behavior John doesn't answer this. Rather, he puts each believer on guard and leaves the burden of proof on the Christian himself. So that was something that I just recognized in myself that as I started, um, as I started changing, as my heart started changing and the offensiveness disappeared, the use of those words and the desires to watch certain shows and things like that just, just left. I just left. There's, um, now, while the Gnostics made great pretensions as to their knowledge, they were very careless about their personal lives. There should be no confusion on this point. A man cannot have spiritual life and go on living in sin. On the other hand, a man can only practice righteousness through having a nature of him who is righteous. So you can't really live a righteous life without the Holy Spirit within you. It's just impossible. Um it should also be added here that men become children of God through the new birth, but there is no birth in connection with the children of the devil. A man becomes a child of the devil simply by imitating his behavior, but no one is begotten as a child of the devil. 
The Lord could have destroyed the devil with a single word, but instead of that, he, the Lord, came down to this world to suffer, bleed, and die, that he might annul the works of the devil. And then verse 9 repeats that, and this was a little, um, this was interesting. Some Bible students think that this verse refers to the believer's new nature. So in 3.9, let me re reference this back that so that we know what we're talking about. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning for God's seed abides in him and he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. So some Bible students think that this verse refers to the believer's new nature and that while the old nature can can and does sin, the new nature cannot sin. However, we believe that here again, the apostle is contrasting the regenerate man with the unregenerate and is speaking of constant or habitual behavior. The believer does not have the sin habit. He does not defiantly continue to sin because as a, um, a follower of Christ, the conviction is there. That moral compass is turned on. So you do begin to recognize behaviors and you do become more intentional. If you're truly regenerated or con um, converted or transformed, whatever word you choose to use to say that you're walking with Christ. The reason that his seed remains in him, there is considerable disagreement among Bible students as to the meaning of this latter expression. Some think that this seed refers to the new nature, others to the Holy Spirit, and still others to the Word of God. All of these are true and therefore are possible explanations. We take it, and meaning the, the writers of the commentary, we take it as the seed refers to the new life which is imparted to the believer at the time of the conversion. Here, then, is a statement that, that the divine life remains in the believer. He is internally secure. Rather than being an excuse for the Christian to go out and sin, his eternal security is a guarantee he will not go on sinning. He cannot sin habitually because he has been born of God. This divine relationship precludes the possibility of continuance in a sin as a lifestyle. There is no half and half. God's children are known by their, by their righteous lives. Um, now we are moving on to chapter four. Test the spirits is the heading of this one. It says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirit to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this, you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And let's see, I made a little note. No, that one wasn't with the previous chapter. So, let me read bottom. Come to the freshest from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard was coming and now is in the world already. So this is the great test of a teacher is to ask, what do you think of Jesus? So that came from um, <clears throat> the need to discern between truth and error. That's where we are now. Having mentioned the Holy Spirit, John is reminded that there are other spirit. John is reminded that there are other spirits abroad in the world today, and that the children of God need to be warned against them. Thus, he cautions the believer not to trust every spirit, and the word "spirit" here probably refers primarily to teachers, but not exclusively so. So, just because a man speaks about the Bible. God and Jesus does not mean that he is a true child of God. We are to test the spirits whether they are of God because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Just another confirmation that even though they were following Jesus and they were believers and they professed their Christian um, values and their Christian belief, there were some that still decided to go off, which means they really weren't convert converted. So they really weren't believers. The greatest test of a teacher 
is, what do you think of Christ? And every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. But rather, it is the confession of a living person, Jesus Christ, come in the flesh. It is the confession that not acknowledges Jesus as the Christ, incarnate. And confessing him means bowing to him as Lord of one's life. And the Holy Spirit always glorifies Jesus. And I made truth is a confession that acknowledges Jesus as Christ incarnate. And confessing him means bowing to him as Lord of one's life. And the Holy Spirit always glorifies Jesus. So that's kind of what I took out of um, you know, testing the spirit because every spirit does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh and is not of God. This is how you can detect the false teachers. They do not confess that Jesus who was described in the previous verse. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which has been prophesied and which is now already in the world. There are many today who are willing to say acceptable things about Jesus, but they will not confess him as God incarnate. And that is, they will say that Christ is divine, but that he is, but not that he is God. And humble believers are able to overcome these false teachers because they have the Holy Spirit within them. And this enables them to detect error and, and refuse to listen. And that, I think, is that is a strong statement because at some point, if you truly are searching for the truth and you truly find the truth and you ask the Holy Spirit to lead and guide you, you have to be humble enough to accept if you're wrong. I had to look at certain things from the New Age that I, I, I'll just share, I loved doing yoga. I loved the way my body felt. I loved the flexibility I had. I loved the ritual. I knew what I was gonna do. I had less back pain. I was um, just more, mo just so many things I gained from the physical aspect of doing the yoga. And I mean, I came this close to signing up to the Christian yoga program and because I just thought, oh, I could just see myself helping so many people feel better. But at the same time, I'm reading the Bible and I'm feeling things. I'm feeling guilty. I'm feeling um, heaviness. All of a sudden, it just wasn't feeling right. And so I started investigating and I started researching and I started YouTubing yoga and Christian and all of that stuff. And anyway, I rabbit holed and found out why I was feeling that way because of the sinful nature that it stems from. And I had to humble myself because once I discovered the truth, because I was already studying the truth, and when that truth came to me, I had to humble myself and say, you know what? I'm wrong. I can't do that and call myself a Christian if I'm purposely doing something that I know that God has convicted me of. And that's what I was feeling, that heaviness and that icky. It was conviction. And you can't put Christian in front of yoga and make it right because it is from a different culture than what we have. So their meaning for that is worshiping their millions of gods. That is what those poses are. And you have to be willing to be humble as you mature. There's going to be a lot of things that God says no to, and you're going to have to accept it because it's black and white. Yes, you can do this. No, you can't do that. Okay. And you have to humble yourself and go. So if you are in a place where you listen to something and it tickles your brain and it makes you question, that is an important step to take. That is an important thing to look into because you have to test this. You have to test the spirits. There's a reason that you are being tickled or whatever. So humble yourself, research, get in the Bible, find the truth and be willing to realign yourself. And so now I do 
Pilates. If I do stretches, I'll just do some stretches to like music or something. Um, but it, it was really hard for me. I'm not, I asked, I mean, I even reached out to other Christians and asked them what they thought about yoga and Christian yoga. And they were like, oh yeah, you know, we have it at our church. People come to our church, but it didn't settle well with me. That answer did not settle well with me. So I had to keep looking. The minute I completely surrendered it and said, if I'm not supposed to do this, I need to know and I need to have that lifted. And y'all, I haven't looked back. I haven't looked back. And I even want to speak out sometimes when I see other Christians, but I'm not there yet because I, I don't want to... Um, this is a whole, I don't even know how I got on the subject. But anyway, if you know that you are finding a new truth to something that you thought was the truth and you are being guided or prompted or in, something from convicted from within, make sure that you need to test that spirit. You need to make sure that what you're currently believing or trusting is truth. Because if it's not and you continue in it, you are being misled just like I was being misled and it is not easy to to do something it is not easy to humble yourself and go okay well I'm not gonna do that anymore but because I want this more I want God more so I shouldn't say it's not easy because it actually the further away I got from it the easier it became so in the beginning yes it was not easy it was a routine. I enjoyed it. I felt good. My body felt good. My spirit did not feel good. So as I moved away from it and my spirit started feeling better, I found other avenues to make my body feel better. So I digress. Back to where we were. Where were we? Um, let's move on down to um, God is love. Marks of those in the Christian fellowship. So this is where God uses, or John uses the word love he, in 45 times within the book. But in chapter 4 is when he uses it the most. He actually uses it 45 times between the chapter 4, verse 8, and chapter 16, or verse 16. So there's a lot of love going on in chapter 4. Um. For God is love. It does not say that God loves. That is true. But John is emphasizing that God is love. Love is his nature. God's love is in three tenses. In verse 9 and 10. So verse 9 states, In this the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. So God's love is in three tenses. In the past, it was manifested to us as sinners in the gift of his only begotten son. In the present, it is manifested to us as saints in his dwelling in us through the Holy Spirit. In the future, it will be manifested to us in giving us the boldness in the day of judgment. First of all, we have God's love to us as sinners. God has sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him and to be the propiti propitiation of our sins. I wish there would have been another word. <laughs> that was tough to say. We are dead and needing light and we are guilty needing propitiation. The expression, his only begotten son, carries with it the idea of a unique relationship in which no other son could share. This makes the love of God all the more remarkable, that he would send his unique son into the world that we might live through him. God's love was not shown to us because we first loved him. We did not. In fact, we were his enemies and hated him. In other words, he did not love us because we loved him. He loved us in spite of our bitter antagonism.
and then 411. We're getting through this, guys. It's going to be, we're getting through this. Verse 11. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. The if here does not express doubt, but rather is used in the sense, the sense of sense. Since God so showered his love on those who are now his people, we ought to love those who are members with us of his blessed family. In John's gospel, we see that the invisible God has made known to the world through the Lord Jesus Christ. Here we have the expression, no one has seen God at any time. And it's repeated in the epistle. God is now manifested to the world through believers. How stupendous that now we must be God's answer to man's need to see him. That was a big thing when I read that. Because Jesus was here. People saw him. He was love. He was God's answer. He died for our sins. Imposed on us the Holy Spirit, and commissioned us to go out and do what he did. Win men to Christ. Help people to see the truth. Be fisher of men. Just share the gospel. Teach them the truth. And we are God's answer to that now as Christians, as Christ followers, since Jesus is not here. He's at the right hand of the throne he's at God's right hand so we are here the Holy Spirit is telling us what we need to do and we know as Christians we are commissioned to go into the world and make disciples of men so God's love is given to us not that we might hoard it for ourselves but that it might be poured out through us to others the blessings of being indwelt by God himself is the privilege of all who confess that Jesus is the Son of God here again, it's not the confession of merely intellectual assent, but a confession that involves the commitment of one's person to the Lord Jesus Christ. No closer relationship is possible than for a person to abide in God and to have God abiding in him. God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God, and God in him. God is love, and the love must find an object. The special object of God's love is the company of those who have been born into the family. And five is talking about overcoming the world. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him. By this, we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the son of God? And the last heading says that you might know. And this is chapter 5, verse 13, heading on down the trail. Um, oh, no, it says, I'm sorry, I skipped a little bit. Our faith, who is that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Only the man who is born of God really overcomes the world because by faith he is able to rise above the perishing things of this world and to see things in their true eternal perspective. He says, this is he who came by water and blood. Did I miss? I must have skipped. I skipped a whole chapter. I'm sorry. We're going back to five, number six. We skipped that. It says, this is he who came by water and blood, that Jesus, Jesus Christ, not by the water only, but by the water and the blood. And the spirit is the one who testifies because the spirit is the truth. For there are three that testify, the spirit, the water, the blood, and those three agree. 
If we receive the testimony of men and the testimony of God is greater, for this is the testimony of God that he has born concerning his son. Whoever believes in the son of God has the testimony in himself. There's a great deal of discussion about over the meaning of those words. Some feel that the water and blood refer to that which flowed from the Savior's side. Others feel that the water refers to the Spirit of God and that the blood refers to the blood shed on Calvary. We would like to suggest a fourth interpretation that takes a particular account of the Gnostic heresy which the Apostle is seeking to combat in this epistle. As mentioned earlier, the Gnostics believed that Christ came upon Jesus at his baptism and left him before his passion, namely in the Garden of Gethsemane. In other words, they would say the Christ did not die on the cross, but Jesus the man died. This, of course, robs his work of any atoning value for the sins of others. We suggest that John is using water as an emblem of Jesus' baptism and blood as a symbol of his atoning death. These were the two terminals of his public ministry. John is saying that Jesus was just as much the Christ when he died on the cross as when he was baptized in the Jordan. This is he who came by water and by blood, not only by water but by water and blood. Men would like to have the Lord Jesus as a perfect man, the ideal example who has been given us a marvelous code of morals. But John insists that the Lord Jesus is not only perfect man, but perfect God also. And the same one who was baptized in the Jordan River gave his life as a sacrifice for sinners. And it went on talking about the baptism. Finally, there is a witness of the blood. On the cross, the Lord Jesus bore witness concerning himself that he was the Son of God. No one took his life from him. He laid it down by himself. If he were a mere man, he could not have done this. The blood of the Lord Jesus Christ witnesses that the sin question has been settled once and for all to the satisfaction of God. All these three witnesses agree as one. That is, they are united in the testimony concerning the perfection of the person and work of Christ. That is the spirit, the water, and the blood being those three witnesses. And so now we jump over to 13. We are almost done. And this is um, mainly to confirm your salvation as a Christian. Um, the letter that John was writing was wanting to um, really make it clear that once you're saved, your salvation is sealed. You are a child of God when you truly confess and you repent and you turn and you start following God and it says I so John says I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life and this is the confidence that we have toward him that if we ask anything according to his will he hears us and if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask we know that we have the requests that we have asked of him. If anyone sees his brother committing a sin, not leading to death, he shall ask God and God will give him life to those who commit sins that do not lead to death. There is a sin that leads to death. I do not say that one should pray for that. All wrongdoing is sin, but there is sin that does not lead to death. We know that everyone who has been born of God does not keep on sinning, but he, Jesus, who was born of God, protects him and the evil one does not touch him. We know, because Jesus gives us the protection, we know that we are from God and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true 
and we are in him who is true. In his son, Jesus Christ, he is the true God and eternal life. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. And I made a, just a little note. This is all, keep all eyes on Jesus. Um, little children, meaning the young new Christians and the new older Christians to the faith. And as you begin to really grow in your faith. And um, it says, okay, the sin leading to death. Because that was, that kind of confused me that there was a sin that didn't lead to death. And then there was a sin that did lead to death. It says that it's impossible to say with finality just what the sin leading to death is. And then it gives you like five different ones. But then it's the one that was compiled by these scholars says, A final explanation is that the sin of apostasy is in view. And we believe that this is the explanation which fits the best with the context. An apostate is one who has heard the great truths of the Christian faith has become intellectually convinced that Jesus is the Christ and even made a profession of Christianity, although he has never been truly saved. After having tasted the good things of Christianity, he completely renounces them and repute, repudiates the Lord Jesus Christ. In Hebrews 6, we learn that this is a sin leading to death. Those committing this sin have no way of escape since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to an open shame. In this entire epistle, John has been speaking with the Gnostics in view. The false teachers had once been in Christian fellowship. They had professed to be believers. They had known the facts of the faith. But then they turned their backs on the Lord Jesus and accepted a teaching that completely denied his deity and the sufficiency of his atoning work. A Christian cannot have liberty in praying for the restoration of such because God has already indicated in his word that they have sinned unto death. And what is, I think that was about the... Um, That was pretty much all that I had made other than in the closing appeal, which is in in verse 21, it says, little children, keep yourselves from idols. And like I said, I did an all eyes on Jesus type little bubble. But the closing appeal here says, lastly, we have John's final exhortation. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Be aware no, beware of any teaching which are opposed to these realities. He wants believers to guard themselves from any ideas concerning God other than those which have been handed down to us by the apostles. Jesus Christ is God. Any other thought is idolatry. Here, John is not speaking primarily of idols carved out of wood. An idol is a substitute or false god taking the place of the true. Here, an idol is not so much a material thing as a false teaching. Archbishop Alexander spoke of this appeal as an eloquent shudder. We can think of no language that could improve on such a description, so we close this commentary with John's eloquent shudder. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Ooh, okay. I shuddered because, yeah. Yeah. Y'all, we made it. Wasn't that just a heavy letter? I'm telling you, I had no idea going into it that it was going to be so heavy. And it is a challenging letter, just like one of the preachers said, is that it is a challenging concept to take in because... He's stating it black and white. You know, there's nothing to be confused about. This is what, this is what it is. And it is what it is. So anyway, I so appreciate you guys um, watching. And I would love to know your thoughts in the comments. If you found this video or this little series of videos helpful and encouraging or, you know, just broadened your knowledge a little bit, please subscribe and like the video, share with your friends so that we can continue to 
get God's word out there. If you have anything to put, add to this, put it in the comments or message me. Um, I want to learn all that I can learn. You know, I don't want to just have the knowledge. I want to have knowledge that I can apply. So I don't want to misstep. I don't want to misspeak. I want to make sure that I am sharing truly what I feel is I'm being led to share and, um, and in the way that I am led by the Holy Spirit to share because I'm telling you, this is some last days and we really need the truth to be out there. We need to help those who are lost. We need to, you know, we need to bring the sheep where the sheep need to be. And so, yeah, anyway, I appreciate you guys hanging in there. These are three long videos and I just appreciate you. Just know that. Okay, guys, I'm off to edit. <laughs>